And boom, welcome back to another episode of AlphaCast. We are coming live. This is a live stream freeform podcast coming from uh, off grid on the Smith River on the border of Northern California and Oregon. Today we have a really cool guest. John Hickman joins us from the UK to share his extensive expertise in horticulture, permaculture, and essential survival skills um, with his primitive skill sets that uh, he displays on his YouTube channel, Primitive Ways. Um, and John Hickman um, uh, from Primitive Ways has heeded the wake up call and empowered himself with the tools most essential for the likely future we now face. His extensive knowledge of horticulture and permaculture is augmented with essential survival skills honed through real life application. John rounds his vast range of off-grid living savvy with a working knowledge in martial arts, nutrition, and psychology. John emphatically states, I can live anywhere with no money or belongings and survive. Freedom from the grips of the control grid is John's objective and a passion we share here at the Alphavedic Off-Grid Permaculture Farm. Preparation is the inverse of negativity. So listen today and learn how to reconnect, reprioritize, and generally reclaim your power. It's time. So welcome, John. Welcome to the show. And of course, uh, we're as usual here with Dr. Uh, Lando. How you doing today, guys? And uh, let's kick in the show. How's it going today? Oh, good. John, and good to have you here, buddy. And uh, thanks for being with us. We've already had a good sh uh, chat, you know, off air here. And uh, and uh, we'll see. We I think got a lot of subject matter we can go into that'll be fun. I know it'd be fun for me. Uh, you know, we uh, live off grid here ourselves and are responsible for providing our own energy needs, our own water, and keeping ourselves warm by gathering firewood and growing food and you know just just about everything. There's no power lines for 30 miles and and uh, you know we get to beam ourselves to the outworld via satellite. But, um, you know, it's nice because when you're responsible for yourself, there's, uh, it's very empowering. And, um, and, uh, and of course there's, uh, the, the, the biggest bonus is being in touch with your surroundings. And last night we we're laying in bed with the windows open and listening to an owl out there and, and, uh, the animals and the birds talk to us every night. You can see the stars and, you know, it's just, it's just a whole different way of life. But, you know, when I watch your videos, uh, which are remarkable, and I'd really encourage people to get to your channel, uh, I feel like I'm living in the Ritz here compared to what you're uh, <laughs> capable of doing as far as your primitive um, uh, survival skills, which I don't think are primitive at all. I think it's a, a very elegant uh, way of living uh, so closely and just being able to provide from scratch. So, you know, uh, we're warm in a nice house and, you know, we call it off grid and everything. And, and there is a certain uh, sort of uh, labor intensity and, and self-sufficiency about that. But uh, you've taken it to a whole nother level. So I'm really, really uh, looking forward to this chat. Awesome. Yeah, you're saying about um, becoming responsible. Uh, I've got to a I got to that stage in my life where I was really, really questioning things and I was going through, you know, deep in myself, the, you know, these feelings, going through feelings and I pinpointed it to this feeling like years ago. I was like, where's this feeling of anxiety coming from? And I realised that it's because I didn't know where to get my water. I didn't know where to get my food. I didn't know how to make my own clothes. I realised that I didn't actually have any way of taking full responsibility for myself and for my life. And it was it left me with a feeling of this kind of anxiety. And as soon as I pinpointed that, I was like, yeah, I've got to do something about this. I can't, it doesn't sit right with me not being able to be responsible. So that's kind of where it all started. I, I started off with bushcraft and, you know, got into the bushcraft first of all and had all the kit, rucksacks and knives and boots and water purifiers and sleeping bags and tarps and was really into all that. And then one day I was just kind of, you know, start thinking, they never used to have any of this. And if I lose my fire lighting rod, if I lose any of my gear, it's like, a, you know, my rucksack was like a scuba diving tank. If I lose my tank, then, yeah, not so good. 
I had become alien to my own planet, I realized. Uh -huh. So I was around that time, I was starting to think, hard oh, on, you know, I need to, I've got to be okay without any of this sort of stuff. And a funny, yeah, look, you know, the way the universe works, literally, I think the next day I was on YouTube and I came across Tom Brown Jr. I don't know if you've heard that name before. No. So, I'm a big oh, yeah. fan of, uh, I'm a big fan of Tom Brown. I read the tracker and, you know, fantasized about being out in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey with Stalking Wolf who taught him. And, and uh, uh, shoot, I read those when they first came out long ago. And then uh, he came, I think he had, what, two or three books. And he's, he's been a little controversial, you know, in, in different circles. Uh, but um, uh, I still love his books. And, and he's got a tracking school, of course. And uh, yeah, big fan of him. I think, he, he, and he really awoke a lot of people in yeah. this country to, uh, you know, to boy, what would it be like just to be truly self-sufficient? Yeah, when I came across him, and I was just, I literally saw a two-minute interview with him, and I kind of knew straight away, I was like, no way, this guy, you know, this guy's got all that ancient knowledge, this guy actually really knows how to how to survive, you know, that wear with nothing and make all his own stuff. And as soon as I came across Tom, I just ordered one of his books straight away. I quit my job. I just, and that was it. I was obsessed. I was like, this is, you know, this is my purpose. This is what I've been looking for my whole life. Is he... I've never been, I've never been a tech person. I've never been into technology. I don't like complicated things. I've always loved simplicity. Um, I even remember being a young boy you know, probably five or six years old. And I remember the first time I understood the concept. I remember my mum telling me, oh yeah, we got to pay to, you know, we got to pay for the house. And I remember kind of being like, what? You got to pay to be here? Hold on, this, no, that, that, what? I just, yeah, I remember that so clearly, just even being young and understanding. So if you've got to pay to be here, then that means that you've got to do something else. You know, I can't just sit in the tree all day or just, hang out in the forest it means i've now got to go and do something else to earn the money to go and pay for that i was yeah so i think my life was probably always going to go this way but uh yeah thanks so much to tom for um for passing on those skills because yeah i yeah, think he's I, is, is he the is uh is is just so i know okay, you're talking about i think i know you're talking about is he the guy who was this in the 60s or uh he eventually went out and just kind of lived in the forest he was trained by a native american elder and he just kind of went out and lived in the forest for a year or two yeah, yeah. i told you about his uh books mike yeah he grew up with uh, a friend of his when they were young uh who was a native american and this uh friend of his had a grandfather by the name of stalking wolf and stalking oh, yeah. wolf was a, a traditional tracker but as you learn through the stories that trackers, you know, are uh, really keyed in. They're not just reading footprints, but they can read the energetics and, and uh, really read between the lines. So uh, him and his uh, buddy were trained to the point when they were little boys where they could go out in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey, which is actually a wilderness area up there that a lot of people don't realize. And, uh, you know, very severe weather conditions. And they go out with nothing and build a little uh, mud hut. and and uh, fend for themselves and and you know get trapped their own food and and uh cut to the chase uh, the very last book um tom brown brown is talking about a story where he goes out i believe it was uh yellowstone where he's in the back country and he's you know winter is approaching and basically he's, he's uh, almost naked and just has a knife and he's heading off into the into the wilderness and this uh, forest ranger tries to stop him and said what are you doing you're going to die out there so anyway uh he not only uh weathered the winter very well but he came back saw that same ranger at the end of the winter and was about 10 pounds heavier than when he went in and uh wow. you know kind of surprised the the ranger so yeah good stories and uh, I, th I think they came out i think i read them in the 70s yeah um but, that's yeah, incredible <laughs> but they get really into the spiritual side of uh, what all that, you know, the real reason why somebody might want to get in touch at that level. So, uh, Bill, so that I'm, sounds like a good inspiration for you, 
John. Yeah, yeah, Tom's awesome. I heard Tom say once, if you if you took two people uh, exactly the same physical ability, the same skills, but one is has a spiritual understanding and the other person doesn't, the person who doesn't have the spiritual side will, you know, just won't last. They won't they won't connect with the environment and they wouldn't, you know, make it through in time. You know, that's what I loved about Tom. It's you know, it's bringing bringing the sort of two worlds together. It's bringing the the, the skills, the bushcraft and stuff like that, and and actually bringing the spirituality together, which you know is really really important. Really important. Yeah, because that sets the foundation for uh, the mind over matter concepts that we talk a lot about, and understanding that reality is we control our own reality. And obviously, when you're forced out into the bush. You know, where with extreme conditions, um, that plays into a massive part of survival, right? Is having the mind over matter concept and that spiritual side is extremely important. That's why we see with the Native Americans here in this country, it was such a crucial aspect of their culture. Yeah. yeah so, John, mindset. tell us about um, uh, tell us about where, what areas do you go out in um, in Great Britain uh, where you can do that sort of thing and be left alone. So where I live in Devon, there's a place called the Moors, which is just a sort of five miles away. And that's quite a big area where they have a right to roam and you can camp and be left alone. But, um, you know, the thing with the UK is, is most of the land's owned. It's very, very split up. There's a lot of people on a small island. And yeah, it's, you know, it's a bit more, you can't just go wandering around anywhere, but there are incredible beautiful places that you can actually go out into the woods but it's not like what you guys have got over there you know we have chopped down most of our forest we don't have well apart from scotland we haven't got any big wilderness areas left so it's kind of smaller smaller sort of bits dotted around but really really beautiful like really really stunning but yeah, yeah. that's what i noticed from your videos is how lush um, and I can actually do a screen share for people watching to see here, but just how extremely lush and almost jungle-like uh, some of the terrain looks like that you're working in. Yeah, it's lush then because it's the summer. And uh, when I put um, the part two of my house video on soon, you'll see, uh, yeah, you'll see the difference between the lushness in the summer to the winter. Oh, it's, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, I'm just showing um, some of the some of the video here from uh, John's channel. If you guys can see the screen share here, and this is a uh, uh, deer skin hand towel, buckskin uh, tanning. And I this video is so impressive the the amount of time and effort. And we'll get into this, but just looking in the um, at the surrounding terrain, just how lush and green everything is. It kind of really reminds me of where we live here in the red by the redwoods. And I mean, we basically live in almost a rainforest here, part of the no. time of the year. But um, I didn't know if you were actually in England or if you were somewhere uh, more subtropical, almost for just how lush it is. Yeah, we had a good summer. We had a really lush summer. That's great. So you were saying to uh, before the show that this is uh, you do actually a lot of this stuff on your own property. Is that right, or is this uh, in that area you were just talking about? Yeah, this this is actually on my own property because um, obviously I'm going to put sort of quite a lot of effort into this spot. I'm going to build a stone house soon and a few other clay structures, and it would be a bit annoying if I was putting all this effort in on you know another bit of land somewhere and somebody could come along and maybe you know vandalize it or something so uh, yeah it's good because i could put a lot of effort in on on this bit and it'll be left alone and i've yeah, always wanted yeah. I've always wanted my own bit of land for years and years and years i've been looking and looking and looking and never found the right bit and then yeah luckily kind of year and a half ago i just saw this bit come up and went and had a look at it and got there and knew straight away like oh yeah this is it this is the bit oh that's great well hey good for you man yeah um Obviously, having your own land and your freedom to go out and play, you know, like going, harking back to your childhood, right? When you're talking about, you know, being able to do this uh, for a living, that's amazing that you're able to do this and, and actually instruct and, and teach people this stuff because um, these are skills that are going to play heavier and heavier into reality as, um, you know, for one, for our own spiritual 
growth that we can get back into the land and get back to nature and, and learn how to, to do these things. It's fun. But two, um, you know, being, being more self-sufficient moving forward as systems break down, potentially with, you know, stuff we've talked about, the grand solar minimum and, and, and economic um, issues arising and everything. These are important skills that anybody can learn and um, especially uh, connecting into permaculture and horticulture and all that. And to be able to do this stuff on your own property is uh, pretty powerful. Um, so yeah, um, the channel, by the way, uh, is called Primitive Ways. It's on YouTube and we'll put the link in the show notes below for those listening or watching. It's yeah, so John, you, you made it. Go ahead, please, John, sorry. I was just saying, it's, it's definitely the most empowering thing like that I've ever done to, you know, to be able to just, just know that no matter what, you're, you're going to be okay. You know, I can make my own shoes, I can make my own clothes, find food, get water. It's, it's really empowering. And yeah, it's taken a huge kind of anxiety out of my life. It's, so, yeah, it's been amazing. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned that you, you know, uh, were your original happiness maybe was because of an anxiety that you couldn't take care of yourself. But I think it's an anxiety that's really pervasive these days uh, in the general population. Um, people may not be educated or understanding it, uh, really what's on the way. Uh, and I'm not suggesting doom and gloom, but we are uh, in for some big changes and they're already happening. So it's not speculation. And, um, you know, but there's this uh, kind of low grade um, anxiety out there because people, I think, in their hearts know they can't trust uh, the infrastructure to take care of them forever. They know that the powers that be that control the, the, the grid that we're all forced to live on um, are really not people that are serving our interests. And, and uh, you know, in our little way here, we're, you know, living off grid, not quite as, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the level that you've developed there. But, um, you know, there is a, a peace of mind that comes from being connected with nature and also knowing that you can't fend for yourself. And the other thing too, it's a very unselfish thing to do because every person that is capable of taking care of themselves um, you know, if things really do get crazy out there, then you're going to be another person that not only is going to be contributing to a collective burden uh, of everybody going into chaos, but you might even be able to help some other people through it, uh, you know, at the same time. Uh, so what do your friends and family think of everything you're doing over there? Yeah, yeah, they're into it. It's, um, yeah, people are really responsive to it, mostly. Yeah, I think it's one of those subjects that attracts everyone. Like, for instance, whenever I'm teaching fire to anybody, you can see, like, the men especially, you can just see people. It, it captures their attention more than anything else, like anything. I've, you know, guys that, you know, maybe they're not so interested in sort of bushcraft or anything like that, but then when they see somebody making fire with sticks, it must be, I don't know, something in there from the primal mind that you can just see people and they're like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, it must be tapping into an ancient part of us. It's got to be. We've been doing this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You know, the, like when I was younger, for instance, you know, there weren't even mobile phones. It's, you know, technology's kind of all sort of sprung up in a really short space of time. And, and like with our society now, it's, I just see it really fragile. I've, ever since I was a young boy, I remember always looking around thinking, yeah, I don't really like relying on technology because it always seems to break and fail. And yeah, I don't know, stuff's not built too well. And like, I don't think we've ever had a time in history where everything's completely connected, everything's so fragile. And when one chain breaks, when one of those links break, it's going to affect everything. We've never been so connected like this before. Yeah. Um, yes. John, so you say from, from well, since you've been a little boy, you've had these anxieties. And so when did you really start getting into uh, the bushcrafting? It sounds like when you maybe were a teenager and then just take us down that channel. When did you um, kind of then go full head into more of the primitive style um, bushcrafting, if you will, and, and just give us a little bit of a timeline and how long you've been doing this? Yeah. 
So ever since I was a young boy, I've always I've always been into you know, into carpentry. As far as I can remember, I think when I was about four or five, as soon as I could hold a saw, I was out in the garden all the time, carving things, making things. I've always loved making stuff. Always loved being really practical. Always loved simple things. Never really been a sort of techno guy. Never been into sci-fi. Always loved the forest. Always. And I loved about well, when I was a teenager, I did get sidetracked and you know, drinking and partying and stuff like that. But then when I got into my 20s, that's when I met a guy, a friend of mine, who got me into bushcraft. And I did that for about eight or nine years. And, you know, after eight or nine years of it, of going through this kit and breaking a lot of kit and wrecking a lot of stuff. And, you know, that's when I started to question, like, well, hold on, they never, you know, they never had magnesium foil rods. You know, they didn't have sleeping bags, they didn't have steel tools, they didn't have none of this stuff. And that's why I was got really curious. I was like, how? How did they do it? How did they do it without all this stuff? And I've always been, I've never liked relying on things outside of myself. You know, I've always liked being very, very responsible. So like I say, as soon as I started to question, you know, the... the I didn't want to rely on this stuff. When I came across Tom and I could see this guy actually did have the, you know, the knowledge of how our ancestors lived, that was it. I was immediately, immediately hooked. That's all I wanted to know. That's all I was interested in. That's just all I spent my whole days doing. I literally quit my job, uh, ended up moving to Portugal because I was trying to travel through Europe to find some big wilderness to go out in and just, you know, immerse myself out in it for years and learn as many of the skills as I could. So I probably did bushcraft for about eight or nine years and I've been into primitive skills now for 10 years. But for uh, about eight of those 10 years, I've literally been doing that all the time, you know, every day, all day and just nothing else. Just wow. been learning, making leather, stone tools, tracking, cordage, weapons, shelter, just everything, absolutely everything. I, I really want to know how I can truly live without money. So you just threw yourself into it. Did you kind of modularly get into it where maybe you had some gear and, you know, a knife and then you just slowly whittled it down, no pun intended, to where you were literally just going out with nothing? Or how did you make that that transition? Yeah, just just like what you said, I did. it was, you know, it was slow. I was, you know, I had some of my own clothing to start with and slowly slowly I learned about making buckskin and then learned about bark tanning so I can make my own clothes and and like when I was in I spent a lot of time in Portugal actually I learned a lot of skills down there um, but there's not very good stones down there so like stone tools were pretty restricted I ended up practicing um, knocking the bottom out of beer bottles and making arrowheads out of them because we didn't have any oh, flint down there that's great that's but like uh, been, permaculture you know, they, 101 right there. <laughs> yeah. The, the connection you, you've made too, I think, is an important rite of passage for uh, the males of our species. And, uh, you know, we had a guest on last week, Troy Casey, who uh, really emphasized, and we agree that uh, the male polarity on the planet is kind of suffering right now and out of touch and really doesn't have a sense of self. And, I think there's something in our DNA that uh, on that primal level that it's really important to make that connection and know how to survive and, uh, you know, provide for yourself, provide for your family on that, on that level. And even though we live in a technological culture now, those skills, I believe that if you do develop them, they translate into our present life. You know, they teach us responsibility and just caring for others as well as caring for the environment. And, uh, you know, just being accountable for yourself. And that's really largely missing, uh, you know, especially for uh, boys and, you know, young men these days. And we homeschooled our kids. And um, one of the things we did is we sent them to Outward Bound at a certain point, which is an organization that at the time we really liked because they, uh, you know, take young kids and, and, you know, kind of supervise them. But then they turn them loose in the wilderness and, and, you know, make them fend for themselves for a couple of weeks at a time. So, uh, you know, really important, I think, what you're doing to be able to teach that to the next generation as well. Yeah, I think they're going to need to know it. 
um it's just you know it's scary i i talk to some people and they kind of don't really want to know but um for, you know for me i think we really have got rocky times ahead and i think these skills are going to be absolutely vital um i've i've not got a lot of faith in uh in our in the systems that we've got in place so yeah, yeah I, I think it's going to be really really important yeah, we we talk about that a lot here, and and the, from the just in time food system to uh, the shaky uh, electrical grid and communi- telecommunications grid to everything being centralized and built upon systems that are, like you said earlier, extremely fragile. And what's even probably more uh, kind of worrisome is that fact that most people this day and age are so used to that system that they don't even know how to even make a, a, a campfire m- with a lighter, much less uh, something like you would do with like a bow, you know, that you craft from uh, wood you find and, and twine that you pull from, you know, from reeds or whatever. And uh, I'd love to get into a little bit of that technology that how you like to build fire and stuff. But most people would, are, are completely useless when it comes to anything uh, to do with being out in the bush or uh, knowing how to forage or, or um, you know, what's edible in the forest. Uh, and if, you know, with the things that are coming, we talk about how there's food shortages already. You know, there's some great channels, too. We're, we're not like um, a, a gloom and doom type channel. We're all about positivity and all about uh, finding yourself and, and expanding on uh, communities that are looking to be more resilient and uh, more in touch with uh, their humanity and uh, more decentralized and coming together for a more of a holistic approach to life. And that's a, in, in many ways a reaction to what's going on in modern society. But there's some amazing channels out there that um, like the Ice Age Farmer, he's great. And of course, David Devine from Adapt 2030 who talk about uh, everything that's going on with um, the food shortages, Yamasa Ranch is another one. Up, uh, uh, and then there's, there's so there's a lot of channels out there that are covering this day to day. So if those out there listening who are like, "What are you guys talking about? This is this is uh, fear mongering." It's really not. It's all based on facts and things that, um, if you do a little research, you can see how fragile the system is. Um, in in like John McAfee is a, a guy I love who talks about how the economic system is so fragile and the need for crypto and and so the list goes on and on and on and so you know seeing you out there um, just doing it is so empowering to folks to empowering to myself because that's really what it takes just like you know we live in such a mental plane too in this modern society where people will tend to rather just be kind of on their couch watching videos and going, yeah, that'd be cool to do someday. But actually going out and doing it is so important. And that's what you did. You just, like you said, quit your job and, and figured out a way to make it happen. And I think that's something that we can talk about right now is like, what are ways that people can just start learning this stuff? Like if let's say, um, you know, I'm living in the city and I camp and stuff and I, and I see that, you know, I have that anxiety about, potential issues with um, where society is going and where I can get food and, you know, bug out, bugging out of the city and stuff. And I got to, you know, kind of make my way. What's a, what's a, like a, what would you recommend for people out there to kind of get into this lifestyle um, in terms of becoming more self-sufficient in the bush and, and learning these techniques? Uh, well, the most important things, um, like understanding what, Tom calls the sacred four. So it's shelter, water, fire, and food. That's normally the order that you would do things in. And I think I think most people out there could go and knock up a shelter pretty easily. Uh, most people know where to, you know, I say most people, but you know, finding water is not too difficult. But fire, I think, is a really good way for people to to get into this. And obviously with YouTube now, you can just put in bow drill or, you know, primitive fire light in, hand drill, whatever. Anybody can go on YouTube and find hundreds of different videos on how to do a primitive fire. So I think the fire, you know, getting people to go out and actually find some wood and actually try and get a fire lit with a bow drill or something like that would be a really good place to start because there's something about making fire, something about making primitive fire that, that really hooks you. You know, when it did, certainly did with me, and I can see it with a lot of people. It's one of those anchors. It can really, really anchor you into it. 
So I would advise people to, you know, go on YouTube and just start watching videos on bow drills. Because it's, you know, it's not, it's not that difficult. It's really not. The hardest bit is actually finding the materials. It's just learning what woods and just going and finding the wood and, and finding out, you know, picking up a piece of wood and working out, is it too rotten or is it too green or is it, you know, is it seasoned enough? That's actually the bit that takes the time. The actual, you know, getting a knife, splitting it down, making a little hole in it, putting a notch and all that, that's, that's actually not that hard. The bit that takes the time is just getting used to going out and finding the right materials. But I would say to people, just just start trying to learn how to make a fire, you know, just start there because it's super empowering. And that's the kind of thing that, that can get you hooked. And also, while, while we have got this resource of YouTube, just to use it because and it's, it's all on there. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll say to people right now, I used YouTube a lot when I was learning my skills. You know, you just put it in, uh, flint napping, fire lighting. Uh, planning anything it's all on there it's such an Beautiful. amazing resource especially for these skills it's brilliant and you but can I do recommend... it you can do it anywhere if you're uh in the heart of london or i mean as long as you're smart about it you can go in your if you have a little backyard or go to a park um, obviously look at your local restrictions and stuff you know uh, find a place where you can find a, a you know a space for a campfire but then go uh, forage for the wood and you can do this in the middle of the city uh that's a brilliant um a brilliant point there and uh, you say YouTube that's where I get most of my info uh, I have some books I, I, I am I'm a fan of books but are you familiar with uh, uh, Alfie aesthetics YouTube channel been around for a while and he's a he's a fellow uh, uh, bloke uh, a Brit um, here I'll do a screen share he has um, he's he's a young he's really funny too and he just goes out and shows you how to do this survival stuff and he's really into the foraging aspect too with uh, the fungus and um, he knows all the Latin words for everything. He's just full of information and hilarious too, extremely entertaining. Uh, I wasn't sure if you knew him. If not, I, I want to connect you guys because um, uh, he is uh, quite entertaining and a fellow countryman of yours. Uh, no, I've not heard him. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, honest, do this. I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know too many other people actually in the UK. Yeah? I've kind of kept myself to myself for a long time, just, just learning and learning myself. Of the yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, his Elfie Aesthetics is his channel, and uh, he's just uh, this is a this is ten ways to make fire with natural tenders, and uh, he just does a great job at narrating, and he's really funny too. Um, he's very uh, not very politically correct, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but um, he does a great job at uh, really. Um, being educational and entertaining uh, at the same time and so anyways uh, check out that channel but spot on with what you say in terms of, um, of using YouTube you might as well use the technologies we have right now uh, versus uh, you know you know use them while we have them and learn these skills while you can so uh, anyways another, uh, thing, um, another thing Tom Brown got into in one of his books is how to survive in an urban environment I don't know if you recall that, but uh, he didn't just go out in the wilderness, but he went into the wilderness of cities, which I consider true wilderness, and uh, survived just fine there too, because he wanted to make sure that he could survive anywhere and anytime. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I guess most people do find themselves in urban environments these days. But aside from that, um, John, what, where would be a good place to start with food foraging? Um, you know, when we really understand our nature around here and how to just walk in the woods, identify things and, and not only find food to eat, but find medicine. So uh, an average person that doesn't know any of that, so how do you, how do you get started with that? I mean, once again, like YouTube, is, while, while we've got it, it's such an amazing resource. It's probably the easiest place for anybody to, to go and start learning about foraging. Have you heard of a book called um, Botany in a Day by Thomas J. Alpel, I think it is? Not, not familiar with that one. That's a really good book because it, um, it gives you similarities in the plant families. Like, for instance, in the mint family, anything that's got a square stem and alternate leaves where the leaves come out opposite each other, 
everything in that family is edible. So just within like a few little bits of knowledge, you now know like a hundred different plants that are edible. So yeah, Botany in a Day, that's the book I recommend um, to anybody who's getting into foraging. That's a cool. really cool that's book. Great. We'll, we'll add that it's on great the you show notes. That be, it's great you mention that because um, there are simple rules that we've known since childhood that you know allow you to identify classifications of plants just by certain characteristics so it doesn't have to be that complicated um so i know you have a a, a vast knowledge in horticulture and permaculture as well um did you just are you self-taught or did you go through other uh, any other channels uh with your permaculture or horticulture training well i got kicked out of school um, a bit early on and when I got kicked out of school I just kind of did what most people do went down the job centre and walked in and they were they said oh we've got a job in a nursery and I was like oh, I don't know I can't really see me working with children and they were like no it's a tree nursery I was like oh yeah I like trees yeah yeah that sounds cool so I I just kind of got thrown into it naturally I just started working on a tree nursery and and then got sent to college and learned about horticulture so it's something that it just naturally happened but like looking back now it's one of the best things ever is when i got into all this sort of stuff i realized like no way this is amazing i know all the trees i know all the characteristics i know which ones are hard which ones are soft and so yeah it just kind of happened naturally and uh i've just always been interested in in that kind of thing as well my, my wife's really into permaculture and as soon as i came across permaculture i was you know, straight away, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Planting things that you can just put in and leave them, you know, rather than things you have to put in, dig them up, do this to the soil and then put new stuff in and turn it over again. It just, yeah, it just seems like a really backwards way of doing stuff. So when I found out about permaculture, it was straight away, it was, that was my kind of thing for sure. But yeah, I've just learned a lot of that stuff just naturally. It just kind of happened. And and most of the stuff I learn as well, I've always, I've always been self-taught. I like to, I like to do it myself. I like to get out there and try it, make all the mistakes, get it all wrong, and learn from that. I'm not so much somebody. Who, I do learn from other people, but I, I just like kind of getting out there and getting on with myself. And I'm happy to make all the mistakes and learn that way. But uh, yeah, it's definitely the best teacher. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're out in the forest and you're seeing how, um, ne you know, the forest doesn't have, I mean, it does have microorganisms and the fungi and stuff doing its duty, and that's how nature works, but you're, there's not people tilling the soil and planting, and yet there's um, more food in the forest than any, you know, the man has ever created, and it's just all natural, and by mimicking that makes all the sense in the world. So um, have you done any of... Uh, work there where you've kind of uh, besides foraging but what's your kind of mentality as far as uh you know in a primitive way uh doing a horticulture in that way where you kind of are working within the land around you growing things yeah i like to spread things around that are good for lighting fires and planting things that are good for making bows you know spreading around the stuff that's that's really really useful uh, when I lived in Portugal, I got to spend a bit of time on friends' land there, and did you know did a lot of planting of different things, and uh, sort of started building a forest garden, that kind of things. So if you guys ever heard, like one of the most amazing things I've ever learned with all all this sort of stuff, was how important, especially with trees, like within the first four inches of the of the seed's life, it shapes the tree for the rest of its life. Like when the, the little tap root comes down, like if a seed falls naturally off a tree, it will land on the ground, a little tap root will come out and then it generally hits air quite quickly. And that causes it to air prune off and then it will send out its little nodes up here, they come out, they hit air, they get pruned off. And this is what shapes trees, you know, in the mm -hmm. very, very beginning stages. This is actually what shapes it for the rest of its life. So when we do our modern stuff and we start, start them off, a little tap root comes down. If they're in plastic pots, a little tap root comes down, hits the bottom of the solid plot, spirals round, eventually finds a hole and then goes through. 
and then the top mimics exactly what's going on down below. So you end up with a tree that goes straight up, it's got no side branches, goes all tall and spindly, not a very good healthy shape. And a lot of the time they just, you know, you get strong wind and they just break and fall over. So like us interfering is, is not helping. I know there's a lot of trees being planted around at the moment. And what concerns me is if they're all started off in plastic pots, they're just not gonna have the strength and all these natural shapes, you know. We just need to leave leave it alone. Like if you just leave a piece of land alone and see what happens, it's incredible. We just leave it, you know, some plants come back, then the trees start coming back, then the trees there, then the birds come back, and then the bigger animals come in. If we just leave nature alone, it's so productive. You know, yeah, we well, really need to kind of step that's, out of the way. That's why um, you know, we talk <laughs> With ancient civilizations, you know, there's there's this notion that we're pretty new, right? We're only twelve thousand years old or whatever, but we see how quickly nature can take over things. And if we have had massive disasters in the past, yeah, nature just comes in and and will cover up man's previous civilizations. We can see how it does that. So I'm firmly uh, in agreement with you. Leave nature alone. Let it do its thing, even on your own property. We're working on building a food forest here and converting an orchard into a food forest. That's that same concept. It's that permaculture concept. Let it do its thing. Um, You know, like Johnny Appleseed, go plant seeds. Don't need to uh, pre-plan. Or I, I mean, I know the big thing with perennials now is doing a root stock and grafting into it and all that. I, I know the theory behind all that stuff, but what you're saying is just like let the seeds fall and, and do their own thing naturally. Yeah, leave it alone. Let nature do the work. You know, the, like we're, everyone's so crazy trying to build free, to, you know, energy technology. And I'm like saying to people, we, we, it's already there. It's called the sun. You know, <laughs> just, just leave it alone. Let it, let it do its thing and it'll be fine. Yeah, but well, yeah, Bill Gates wants to cover the sun, study. so. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah convention- horticulture studies uh, you know they're always talking about crop rotations and all sorts of techniques and they get really mental about it I you know in my studies in uh, agriculture and uh, you know we just sat there and rolled our eyes the whole time because we already had a background in growing things and and uh, just you know living in nature and you just have to let things uh, go you know we know with some of the techniques that we use that um, plants really need to create their own communities and then the soil and the roots of uh, all the plants um, become accustomed to each other's you know, actual and electrical events. So, uh, you know, and then things really become robust and sturdy and, and just take care of themselves. But, you know, with conventional studies, they're always telling you to disrupt that. And, well, you know, if you planted this, you know, then you want to, you know, rotate and put something else in there to, to do, you know, so yeah, it's just leave things alone. And uh, isn't it remarkable too that when you are uh, doing the things that um, you're doing that really money has no place in anything <laughs> and you realize how fake it really is. And uh, isn't it interesting also that um, the average person now, uh, you know, every waking moment from the beginning to the end of their life, all their uh, concern about is making money, storing money, and uh, money has become this conduit that we equate with true survival, which in fact, um, it can go away in a moment or be altered in a moment or used as a weapon against people in a moment. And uh, that's exactly what's happening. So um, that's why what you're doing is so essential. And again, uh, people uh, just have this, I think, underlying sense that life is pretty tenuous these days because we've based our entire reality and our entire survival on something that doesn't even exist, which is money. So um, people say, well, you still got to pay the rent. How am I going to you know, uh, make that transition? So any ideas... Uh, you know, you've obviously done it and, and even found a way to, you know, like we have, uh, to make money at a, at a certain level just so you can interface with the system when you have to, but at the same time, uh, be off the grid. So any advice on that for the rest of us? Yeah, I mean, the reason why I see money as a big problem is because it puts a price on nature. I mean, the reason we're destroying nature at such a vast rate is because we're destroying it to turn it into money. 
is where if money just disappeared, then we'd realize that the value is in nature and not money. It's, yeah, it's a shame. This, this money's a, we're in a huge catch-22 situation because most people need it. So, yeah, they just kind of keep using it. And, but, yeah, we're destroying our world because of this stuff. It's, um, it's a real, real shame. It's, yeah, it breaks my heart, actually, seeing all the nature getting destroyed all over the place. Yeah. Um, well, can I, yeah. bottom line, bottom line, we put a price on life. And, uh, like you said earlier in our conversation, uh, you know, earn a living, uh, who made that one up? Uh, you know, we're born as divine beings and all of a sudden somebody out here says, well, you have to earn a living. And then of course, like you just, uh, said, so brilliantly it's it's we put a price on nature and uh it is a catch-22 and i think um the only way to get out of this is just to jump in with both feet and reconnect just like you're doing mike sorry go ahead what you're gonna say i was gonna just say that we, we talk about these tenuous times coming and that's this is the universe getting us back to homeostasis right we've been way out of out of balance uh for a long long time I would say since the fall of Atlantis and that gets, I know woo woo for people, but we talk about the Celts before, um, you know, we came on the show and the Celts were a great example of a, of a culture that really got it. Uh, they were scientifically really evolved, but also really in touch with nature. And they had that, uh, that Druidic tradition and understood the, the, the natural forces at play. But I feel like we are moving back towards that. And I, I'm really positive about the future we're headed towards. And I feel like as we are forced into understanding that we need to um, really change, the new technologies are going to merge. And it's almost like that movie Avatar, where they go and they see those people that are like wor working with nature. And then you have the mechanical, you know, al uh, aliens who are really us who come to attack them with our, with our, mechanical, materialistic, digital stuff versus the analog, organic technology. And I feel like that's the future we need to move into and we are moving into, which will be analog, which will be organic, which will be using permaculture and resilient systems that are, are using the power of the sun and the power of zero point and the power of, uh, of, of electricity and, and our own consciousness. And you are a great example of, uh, of an awakening that is happening is that going back to nature and then integrating that in into our lives in a way that is community based. So where we have these, these cities that aren't, um, aren't so uh, based on the individual and based on these kind of isolated, the isolated mentality of the modern era, which is like everyone for themselves and everyone making money and everyone working really hard. Like if you, you look, there's a general trend of a holistic trend towards understanding and awakening that no, being a human is all about being creative and it's all about collaborating and it's not about competition. It's not about um, fighting each other. It's about abundance. It's about going back to nature and it's about understanding all these concepts. And I feel like we can move towards that way. And that's what this channel exists so that we can bring all these concepts together. So yes, we are moving towards the future. We're not going to be in you know, maybe for a little bit, if things get really bad, we will be in loincloths and, and making our own fires and living in wood in mud huts. If there's a massive reset, especially if we have natural disasters, but I feel in a more positive way that we're going to be moving towards more of an avatar that that world where we're integrating more with nature because we're going to be forced to do that, and we will knock the shackles off of the controllers and uh, have these um, these really cool. Uh, societies or these these uh, local communities that are integrating you know a lot of the stuff you're doing and we'll have the elders or we'll have people like you that are playing an important role in the community as educators um, where our schools our children will be going to will be learning all these skills because as we integrate them into um, into this into the culture and people might say hey that's kind of hippie and very like idealistic but I think we're going to be forced into it. So might as well integrate it in a much more kind of future focused way so that we can, um, you know, move forward as consciousness develops versus um, completely letting it collapse. And, uh, and really then, yeah, living in, in mud huts, 
because that's going to be the only alternative. So no matter what, my point is, we're going to have to move this way because the universe is forcing us this way. So um, that's my two cents on that. And it's, I think it's overall a really positive message. Um, so I think one thing that Bear was kind of alluding to is, you know, you, you've done it, we're doing it. How can people, and this is something we can all brainstorm on, how can people living in a city or living in a world, doesn't matter where you live, can start doing this in a way where they can stop, you know, depending so much on money and start getting more in touch with nature, using these skills so that they can even turn a livelihood towards this. And one thing I'll say is permaculture, like getting into doing your own farming, growing your own food, you can then turn that into a living. There's a huge resurgence of small farmers who are doing farmers markets and, and becoming market farmers and, and um, working with, you know, gourmet chefs and stuff and that in the cities doing that. Um, any other ideas, John, as far as maybe becoming an educator or a YouTuber um, like yourself or whatnot um, to, to start actually converting this into new ways of making living um, in the current system, but also engaging with these practices? Yeah, I mean, my advice was I mean, something people could try no matter where you live, literally, where in the sea, wherever, is to try and live as just for a little period of time, try and live as simply as you possibly can because it's kind of one of the tricks that we sort of live under is that you know you need this and you need that and you know and and actually you don't need very much at all you know life can be incredibly simple we've kind of all been sort of tricked that oh you know oh living simply oh it's just basic oh whatever but you know for me like if you just live a simple life it actually gives you time for the for the things that really matter in life with you know true human connection hanging out with friends, having a laugh, sat around a campfire. You know, those, those are the things that really matter to people. I like watching interviews with um, millionaires and billionaires and you get chatting to them and, you know, they can do anything. They can go anywhere. They can go on helicopters, whatever. They can do anything they want, anytime. But you chat to these people and they all say the best time they've ever had is when they were just hanging out with their buddies recently, playing cards, having a laugh. You know, just... It's just that human real connection with friends, family. Those are the things that really, really matter. And it's a complicated life that gets in the way of those things. So my advice to people is try and live as simply as you possibly can. And I know it's difficult for a lot of people because we're, we're trying to, a lot of people are trying to distract themselves all the time. You know, we live in this world of distraction that people have got maybe a lot of emotional upset that they have trouble dealing with they want to distract themselves from so so much life becomes about distraction but my you know i really just think we need to start living more simply i think that's just the key to so many things because most of the things in people's worlds is to is to just entertain them and distract them but if people could get into a more comfortable position in themselves start living really really simply and then we'll start bringing back the richness and the things in life that really matter. Um, and it, it, <laughs> if I say, um, go ahead. Do you, uh, if I say no, pallets, no. those wooden pallets that things get delivered on, do you, do you know what those are? Oh yeah, that we use those all the time. That's permaculture yeah. 101, baby. Just use those. I, I, I went and uh, uh, forged those in city, forged those and uh, built, uh, you know, a three system composting with those. Uh, a couple awesome. months ago. so like anybody pretty much anywhere over the whole world everybody's got access to pallets so like we're saying about the fire lighting just go and find a pallet find a pallet cut out one of the little panels use the bit as a baseboard make a little thin bit for the spindle you know anybody who hasn't got access to nature at all just go and find a pallet or just some scrap bits of wood that are lying around in a city you know anything there's always some kind of resource but just go and find some sort of wood and, and start trying to learn how to make a fire. It will, it will change your life. And uh, it will certainly um, let you know whether you're a patient person or not. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Someone in chat here, uh, TVP Stephen, thanks for uh, bringing this up. I was familiar with this Ubuntu. It's this uh, one small town initiative. And the objective is to turn just one small town in any country into a model for other towns to follow. Uh, the kind of place that most of us have dreamed of all our lives, um, you know, a world free from economic slavery, a social structure that is holistic. Uh, and that's a really cool concept. OneSmallTown.org is the website. 
And that's funny. That was kind of something I was thinking about here, um, Bear. We had a we have a permaculture guild that we're starting, uh, John, um, where a lot of people are coming together. And while we live in a a large county with just all trees everywhere, and it's a small population, um, there are a lot of really cool people that live here that get it. And I think that's a brilliant idea to like use permaculture and use a lot of stuff you're talking about to really be an example. Uh, with a small population here to like turn things around and, and, and do these experiments here because while you can have these skill sets we talk about a lot is it's really hard to do it yourself. You need community, right, John? Yeah, community is, you know, really, really important. That's, that's to me is the thing that we've lost, the thing that we've really, really lost years ago. We would have lived in tribes. Everyone would have worked together you know, all the children could have played together, all the mums could help each other out, everyone's supporting each other, you know, connection, uh, cooperation is, you know, it's really, really important. And yeah, that's something that we, you know, we need to go back to is bringing people together again, because we're just so, so divided and so spread out. I, I like listening to stories, whenever there's been a disaster anywhere, and you know, the kind of the system that's in place gets taken out, when when they start rebuilding things and it's sort of getting going back to normal, people start going, hold on a minute, we actually preferred it when it was, you know, when the system wasn't in place. We all pulled together, everyone was helping each other out, everyone felt a sense of purpose and place. So yeah, the, living in human beings are supposed to live in communities. We're not supposed to live divided or like this. We need to help each other out. It's um, That's heartbreaking nice. to see single mums struggling on their own, people everywhere, but yet people are so lonely. Yeah, but, uh, you... uh, the most unfortunate thing about uh, technology is it, it is divisive and people stop communicating and, uh, you know, just become their own islands. Uh, you know, when you've lived long enough and, you know, I can remember back in our childhood that it was so uh, kids growing up now would find it so foreign uh, in contrast to the you know, the way we grew up compared to the way things are now. So a lot of the things that you're describing uh, aren't idealistic or hippie or uh, unreasonable. It's, it's the way it used to be. You know, people used to uh, be more self-sufficient. Uh, communities were, were tight. You knew your neighbors. You had social gatherings. Um, yeah, uh, our permaculture guild that... Um, it's fairly new this year. We had a meeting this last weekend and it was uh, great. Everybody came up to our farm here and uh, there's uh, members. Uh, a lot of them have their own projects and their own little small farms. So we not only compare notes and share ideas, but we uh, in a more of a cooperative way, we share, um, you know, our products because we all do things a little different, produce different things. Uh, we're all uh, supporting each other and how to make a livelihood off what we do. Uh, it's not a competition, so it's a, a whole different business model. And, uh, and then along with it, uh, the, the goal of the, the mission statement of the uh, guild is to, um, you know, share what we're doing with the outside community. Because as we've been talking, there's a, a great need and also a great interest to just regular folks that are living more in the towns that, uh, you know, really want to know what we're doing. So we provide education. We uh, show people how to get off that grid, uh, how to, you know, live the best of both worlds. And, and I think that's, you know, what we're really up to these days. Yeah. And I, can need I to, sorry, go ahead, John. People need, I think people really need to understand as well about um, the importance of leather Oh, hold on. I've just got to call my mate. His battery's running low on his computer. It's not plugged in. So I've just got to shout my mate so he can plug his computer in. Okay, no worries. I'll, I'll mute you. Um, what I wanted to say real quick, Bear, on the point of the technology thing, and obviously we talk about this all the time, it's all about balance, right, on the polarities. So we're seeing it while technology, you're so right. It can be, we're seeing it with like the millennial generation. They're the most connected, but also the most depressed because they're, you know, they get stuck in that, that social media, you know, scanning through everyone's lives, which isn't the real lives. It's like a, a, a kind of a impression of, uh, of what their lives are, but really they're just taking their best moments and putting them online and they seem connected, but they're disconnected. And that's so true. But also on the flip side, 
of the um, polarity is that uh, this technology is connecting us so much, like what we're doing right now. Like John's in the UK, you're on the other side of the river, here I am, and yet we're having this amazing conversation that people are literally talking in the chat right now and bringing up amazing things. So what we were talking about on the chat right now is actually like, as far as the future goes, is like, we need that balance because with, we're talking about automation right now and how humans are not meant to be machines working in factories. We never were. We're, we're creative consciousness. And the automation that's coming, uh, as long as it's done in the proper way that's decentralized and not uh, controlled by centralized systems, can be super empowering because it can take that need away from us to, to be working in those factories and instead being these creative souls as long as we have that balance and we have that those rites of passage and we have the elders that teach with wisdom and we've got those communities that come together um, that work holistically together um, then that those technologies can be so empower <clears throat> empowering because we can have the locality where we have our food that's locally sourced and we have we have the elders teaching our kids but then we're all connected globally so that we're not just lost like in the past where we were easily controlled because we were just stuck in our tribes while the kings ruled over everything. We can be this, have this global consciousness, but still have the, the, the physical, our physical needs, which require that, that tribal uh, existence. How are you doing, John? Are you back? Yeah, I like that. I like what you just said there. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what I wanted to say was, um, I think it's really important for people to understand the importance of leather. Like if there's one thing I've learned from spending a lot of time at living outdoors is, um, is, is leather is just amazing. Like it's, it's, I think everybody should learn how to make leather because in the future it's going to become one of the most important materials. Like if you think, if you're going to, if you're in a, anywhere in a cold climate, if you've got nothing on your feet, it's, it's not a good place. So, you know, being able to bark tan some leather so you can make some, uh, you know, sort of moccasins or kind of, you know, sort of primitive boots is so important. Like leather for clothing, it's the only clothing that you can make that will last, you know, 40, 50 years. Obviously, wool, wool's great underneath, but for an outer layer to keep the wind out and for some clothing that actually really stands the test of time, leather is yeah it's really important and i know leather at the moment it's not fashionable and obviously you know veganism's getting quite popular these days and people are kind of you know not sort of so connected with animals but people one day will start to realize how important this material is it's something that out of all these skills i've learned it's it's the one that i'm most fascinated by and i, that I understand is probably one of the most important skills being able to make leather being able to make leather so you can wear shoes belts strong cordage clothing that lasts you know tents you know bags containers uh, it's like containers for instance we got containers everywhere in our modern world we got access to containers everywhere bottles tins buckets everything but in nature finding the containers actually really really difficult so it's one of those things that we can take so for granted. But if you think when all the plastic's gone and when all the glass stuff's got broken, what are you going to use as a container? Containers are so, so important. So if anybody out there is listening, if they, anybody's got access to animal skins and tea bags, if anybody drinks tea, just get an animal skin, chuck it in a bucket, fill it up with water, chuck a load of tea bags in there and just start learning how to tan skins. Because I actually think this is one of the things that's going to catch people out in the future is not knowing how to make um, clothing and footwear. It's really, really important. Wow, that's cool. I've got it. I'm showing you doing a process right now of tanning. I think that's a deer hide. Um, and that's a great point. Leather, I'm a huge fan of leather. And, you know, the, the veganism, I get it. The veganism thing and all that, we've, we've, we've covered that ad nauseum here. Um, and there's that's goes back to how we don't have a holistic society where we have a centralized uh, uh, factory society where these animals are, um, you know, basically treated like commodities. We don't have that um, that community focus. Like if we were truly living in a world that was um, 
spiritually inclined and and holistically inclined we would have be raising our animals and using them properly in a way that was um, like the native americans would or you know and um you know life serves life and our consciousness is what actually creates the reality around us these animals are here because we brought them here we created them and um as long as we're in balance with them we use each other and um you know life e life eats life and um and uh, that's spot on um another thing too is beeswax um that's something that my like for instance my wife's making we're getting into beekeeping and that's uh present she's doing for christmas is she's we're, we're really big fans of using um different fabrics with beeswax for instead of plastic wrap for um you know food uh storing food and stuff um so but uh leather as far as like uh you know, using leather for pouches and storage and, and transporting things and, and, and shoes. Great point. Um, yeah, uh, that's a fantastic point you're making there. Yeah, when nature grows back, you know, when you're going to be pushing through nature, there's only one thing that you can have wrapped around you that's going to protect your body and it's going to stand the test of time and it's leather. I've really, really learned this. I've lived outdoors now for the last... 23 years are those leather shorts you're wearing right there in the video are those yeah made? yeah so they're buckskin so that's what you'd call smoke tanned leather rather than bark tanning rather than getting the tannic acid out of bark and tanning it that way what you're doing is you're getting the skin and you're scraping off all of the parts that you don't need and then it's actually the smoke from the fire is actually what's preserving the leather and stopping it from rotting and stopping animals from eating it so it's, um, it's a very soft leather. It's like a suede feel both sides. It's not very, well, it's not waterproof at all. Um, if it gets wet, it kind of acts a bit like a wetsuit. It does kind of keep you warm to a certain level, but ideally the, the buckskin makes really good underlayers and then bark tan leather you'd wear, you know, to make like an outer layer that's more waterproof and more windproof. Yeah. So there's yeah. quite a few different ways of making it. Yeah, that's and, uh, a great trade to know for sure. And that's, that's and, another good example of uh, getting into, uh, you know, into a trade, uh, making a living uh, in the current system, um, going out and uh, we need more people making, being craftsmen like that, right? Old world craftsmen doing leather. Yeah. And uh, men in town in the the UK. UK. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, every no, town no. in the UK used to have a bark tannery, like every single town. So there's, we would have had hundreds of bark tanneries. And guess what? There's one left in the whole of the UK. There's one left. Wow. In, in, the, in the Northwest here, there's uh, just a few people making traditional moccasins out of leather, you know, minimalistic style moccasins. And they're very sought after and they make great businesses and um they're they're much better for your feet you know the shoes that we get not only are they synthetic materials that aren't good for your body but they have all these uh built-in arch supports and things that people think that they need and and just a lot of overbuilding whereas if you get back to uh, the original technology of your bare feet or if you need a covering have it minimalistic with the leather moxon style uh it's a lot better for your structure your uh, bones and it will be stronger your your entire skeletal structure will will benefit from it and it's even catching on commercial commercially because there are a number of uh, like five fingers and arrow shoes and a number of other companies that are all you know riding that wave of understanding by putting out minimalistic shoes but it really doesn't take that much to do your own and probably have it a lot nicer materials and work even better if you make your own yeah i've got some of those uh vibram five fingers they're cool because once you've worn a pair of moccasins for any length of time it's very difficult to go back to a sort of clumpy bulky footwear it just feels like you've got your foot inside a block of wood yeah so i, I sort of i struggle with that now i can't wear heavy boots anymore i used to love wearing boots in the woods and after wearing moccasins for years in portugal I just kind of wear like a sort of suede skate shoe most of the time now, even if I'm going out in the woods and I'm going to be trudging through rivers or whatever. I don't care if my feet get wet, so what they'll dry off is one of the things that annoys me with the Gore-Tex boots is your feet 
get sweaty in them and then the moisture's trapped in the inside and it can't get out and then once your feet's wet they don't dry off and yeah just all this stuff that people think's great and it's you know it's like forward and yeah most of the time just the really simple basic stuff is actually so much better and just just work walking barefoot is the best thing possible it gets pretty cold around here during the winter we'll even get a little ice on the ground and even layers of snow and uh, i'll walk outside do yard work and everything in bare feet you know it's people don't understand it's it's a real uh, important grounding process to let the energy of the earth come up through your feet and with shoes it just it just doesn't happen and then uh, you know as far as the elements and keeping your feet warm yeah there's times where you're out extended periods and you want to you know protect yourself a little bit but uh, it, it's totally easy to go out in the snow or any kind of elements with bare feet and actually be fine for quite a long time have you guys heard have you guys come across um wim hoff his name is he's yeah, known he's, as the uh, ice man big yeah fans. we uh big fans i uh jumped into his program with both feet uh when he first came out and uh, i was already doing kind of versions of it but uh yeah i do cold therapies every single day and a real real important thing and another part of just being out in the elements you know is just not being afraid of temperatures and then uh you know of course he's proved that it's actually good for your health it's also yeah, good for really your good. mind yeah it saved my wife's life um one morning my wife woke up and her left arm had gone completely blue we didn't know at the time but she had two 12 centimeter blood clots in her main vein so she got rushed into intensive care. She pulled through and when she came out, she was having to go on these sort of injections to thin her blood. And at the time when all of this was going on, I was really into Wim Hof and I had a, a wheelie bin out the front of our house that I'd fill up with water and I used to go out there every morning and break the ice and then get in there. And my wife had come back. She'd been back from the hospital for about a week or so. And, and she said to me, she said, I'm going to, I'm going to start going in that, that bin of cold water. I think, you know, I think it's going to help. And she, she got in there the first time she got in the water for like 30 seconds. And she noticed that afternoon, because when she would exercise, her arm would start to go blue again because the blood wasn't circulating properly. But after, after four times of going in the cold water, her arm had stopped going blue. And two and a half weeks later, she went back for another scan and the blood clots were completely gone. And that's just from getting in cold water. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. I know there's testimonials of people with, with arthritis and um, autoimmune disease. Obviously it's really good for blood clots, cardiovascular disease, cancers. It's, yeah, it's amazing. It's one of those things that, that actually works. It's 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 the best healing modality available and it's uh it's completely low tech uh back in sports uh you know we knew that if you want to recover you know we, after practice if you hurt yourself you jump in the ice tank and then it came to a point where we didn't even wait to get injured you know during intensive trainings like two a day football camps and that sort of thing where you're just pretty beat up every single day. At the end of the day, you jump in and a full submersion ice tank. They had those uh, like aluminum bats, you know, that look like those uh, uh, um, hydrotherapy whirlpools that they use for athletics and just fill it up with ice and, and we just sit in there. And after a while, you actually got used to it. It was torture the first few times, yeah. you know, because you, you literally ache and go numb. But um yeah, ice is, is the best thing. That's why when Wim Hof came in and demonstrated with, uh, you know, research, uh, you know, the things that were happening internally, and then also coupled it with certain breathing techniques. Um, uh, yeah, uh, love the guy and what he's doing. Uh, that's yeah, amazing I, I that think... you found that your wife's found that. Uh, same thing here. I've been dealing with pain and from a childhood injury and nothing would work. And I jumped, I bears tell me at Wim Hof for years. I finally jumped into it uh, September and I'm now, or October, beginning of October, I'm now uh, two and a half months in every day doing the protocol, uh, the, the three um, cycles of breath. And I took a cold shower right before 
uh, this talk. I, I've been doing a cold shower, freezing ice water uh, every day, and my pain's gone. Uh, the inflammation's down. I feel amazing. It's totally changed my life. I've dove into more breath work now. I'm really like going down channels I never knew existed. Um, Wim, uh, yeah, he's a he's an inspiring character for sure. Yeah, he deserves a Nobel Prize. I think. I think what he's uh, contributed to humanity is amazing. Yeah, I hope I get to meet him one day to say thank you. What a mm -hmm. legend! Absolute legend that guy is. He is, and you know, so I'm sure you're using a lot of those practices because you're out, out there with just like that video is showing you're wearing uh, some uh, like a leather shorts that you made yourself um, and that's it. And it's not super toasty in England where you are all the time. I mean, are you out there in the elements doing that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get in the river every single night, that stream that you can see in my videos, that's it's a triple spring fed stream. The, the springs aren't too far away. So the water is really cold. And I normally get in there every night before I go to bed. Um, yeah, I'm really, really into cold submersion. And yeah, when I'm filming my videos, I'm just filming in my shorts. And uh, it's not very warm over here at the moment. <laughs> so yeah, the Wim Hof methods have really, really helped me uh, to shoot my videos for sure. That's amazing. Um, and Wim says, you know, this it all makes sense because back in the day, this is how we were. Um, you know, we didn't wear a lot of clothes. And we were really connected with nature in that way. And I, you know, what they're finding uh, is that it's waking up a lot of this uh, ancient neuro um, pharmacopoeia we have um, to protect ourselves against the cold and not only protect, but thrive and, and, and basically really initiate a lot of these, uh, these immune uh, these immune reactions and everything. And Dr. Lando's better at explaining this to my, than me, but um, so once again, this is all empowering, like getting back into the, into nature and, and being more in, in touch with um, our physiology in that way uh, and shedding off some of the stuff that we've, that we've just gotten so used to uh, wearing to protect ourselves. We've gotten very weak in, in many ways because of that. So there's just so many elements to what you're doing in terms of health and in physical health, mental health, spiritual health. Um, it just seems like there's really uh, nothing anybody can lose from just starting to do the stuff that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, so John, very you, empowering. John, you, it sounds like you've had a background in martial arts too. And, um, you know, martial arts, I think a lot of people equate it with fighting and, and there is that element involved, but it's really about learning how to uh, move in natural flowing movements that mimic the, the normal spirals and the way nature, you know, moves in its creative cycles. And, um, and also, of course, learning how to use your mind to direct your energy and, uh, and also to um, uh, just uh, allow yourself to not be, uh, let's just say, a victim of your environment, but actually in control of your own, of your own world. So how has that played an important part with you? Yeah, it's... I, uh, to the martial arts that I'm really interested in now is Wing Chun. I used to do Kung Fu and boxing and kickboxing, that sort of stuff. And then I was really fortunate when I was in yeah. Portugal. Um, I just happened to meet a guy who'd been doing Wing Chun for like 28 years. And, and he said, yeah, yeah, come over, you know, and I'll give you an all day lesson for 20 euros. So it's been a blessing. I, I spent I spent like six months with this guy learning loads and loads of him. Like Wing Chun's been, um, I've always been fascinated with Wing Chun and I was so blessed to actually find somebody that could, you know, really, really teach me one-on-one -on -one and, you know, this is why you do that. That's why you do that. And Wing Chun's very much about like the kind of things you're saying, understanding uh, energy and the movement. It's, yeah, it's brilliant. And it's also, help me as well condition my body i've got one of those wooden dummies that you see people train on and oh, yeah. i've been amazed actually for years <laughs> right cool yeah. i've been amazed how tough how tough the human body can get you know when when it you know when you hit this dummy over and over and over again how how conditioned all the tendons and ligaments get how dense the bones get and you know, like when I sleep outside now, I'd sleep on pretty much just straight onto the bare clay ground and my just body's got used to it now. It's just a lot tougher and 
And I just think that's something else that we're sort of suffering from. You know, we live in this such comfort padded world that it, you know, weakens our bodies as well. As soon as you get outside and start actually getting connected with the outside world, it, you know, it really toughens you up. And yeah, it's just something else that we're really missing. In Chinese medicine, they call that Wei Qi. It's uh, more the surface protective energetic. And it's true that you do toughen up your tendons and, and connective tissue with that kind of training. Uh, but what you're really doing, like Wim Hof talks about, is you know, you're using your mind to cultivate your own energy field. And um, you know, like in, in football in the old days, we'd uh, you know, I tell the story all the time where you first couple weeks uh, of training, you know, you're black and blue at camp and, and just sore all the time. But then, and we used to call it hitting shape. A couple weeks later, you were fine. You know, you'd take the same hits, do the same training and no bruising, no pain, no nothing. And now I look back with what I know now and I realize what we were really doing. Sure, we're toughing up our physical body, but it's more about developing that, that shell of Wei Qi. And we're working on the, the Wing Chun dummy, which was always one of my favorite training techniques. It's, Wing Chun is absolute economy of motion, and it's all close in. It's the basis of uh, Bruce Lee's system, which is uh, I got uh, into it actually through uh, studying him, you know, back in the, the 70s and, and early 80s. But um, yeah, you, and then also using uh, their different herbs uh, that anybody can uh, pick or grow themselves that you can apply on your skin and it has that same energetic effect to, you know, uh, toughen your, your hands and your extremities. So when you do strike hard surfaces, um, there's, there's no damage to your body. And then, of course, what uh, those uh, martial arts techniques uh, do mostly is you do with the internal training where you're literally packing, you know, the energy that you bring in with the breath and, you know, when Hoff is big about breath work, but uh, with breath, if you understand what you're doing, you can, uh, you know, uh, bring the energetics, uh, you know, in the atmosphere into your body and, and pack your bone marrow and, and, and just make your body resilient from the inside out. So um, now that gets a little advanced and it seems a little too busy probably for the average person. But with everything that you're talking about here today, it's just uh, as far as just going out into the elements and feeling at home and, and just curling up in a ball on the ground and being totally comfy and actually luxurious is uh, something that would be a good knack to uh, develop. And, uh, and it's nice to be able to do that. Martial arts is, you know, I know in my background, it's been a real important part of the, the whole experience. Yeah. Something of, I think a lot of people as well, like when they you know, go outside and go camping, people sort of think like they're not going to be so comfortable or whatever like that. I find that the more, the more skills that I've got, the, the more comfortable I am. Like, for instance, there's one of, uh, one of the videos on my YouTube channel where I'm just building like a little leaf hut, a survival shelter. And when you're filling up the inside, the insulation to keep you warm, before you stuff all that in, I put like a bed of quite thick small twigs in and it acts like a little springy mattress and then you put grass on the top of there and then put some leaves on and then when you climb in there and get on top of all that it's so comfortable it's so comfortable and warm like one of the techniques I like uh, when I hang up a hammock is rather than taking an, an under blanket with me I'll hang the hammock up quite low to the ground and then bunch loads of leaves up underneath it and then in the morning when you wake up, I'm super toasty warm and you just put your hand in the middle of the pile of leaves. And it's like a fire in there, it's so warm. It's, you know, just with a few simple bits of knowledge, you can actually be really comfortable and, and really protected. Yeah, you gotta get off the ground, right? You lose a lot of uh, your heat through the ground if you don't. And I've seen just through bushcrafting videos, spruce is a great tree for that because it's springy to use as uh, natural bedding and also, um, I've, saw, I've seen some great videos on people using fire with uh, fire shields, right? So where you use on one side of the back of the fire, you use wet, or wet logs or, or logs that aren't so seasoned so they won't catch on fire. And then it bounces that heat back 
And then if you create the right structure that has a backing behind you, you can kind of get this like pocket of heat where you could be, you could be out in negative 10 degree Fahrenheit weather and be fine. Yeah. Quick question on the hammock thing. Do you make, have you made it like your own leather hammock or are you still using kind of traditional? Well, hammocks? I have, I have made a buckskin hammock, but it's, it's not in any of my videos yet. Um, something, something that I'm going to do very soon. Like I'm probably going to start it next week. I'm going to have another channel and it's probably going to be called wilderness ways bushcraft. And that's a channel where I want to, make kind of like all my own clothes from sort of a bit modern leather and then make some boots start making rucksacks show people how they can make their own rucksacks then i'm going to make leather hammock leather bivy bag uh sheepskin sleeping bags that's something i've already started making they're amazing wow but yeah sheepskin sleeping bags leather um leather tent uh leather climbing harness it's yeah something else i'm really really excited about because um leather works kind of my passion now i've been a carpenter for years i got into metal casting started i was a knife maker got into metal work but then when i started making well i got into the primitive skills and i started hunting my own animals and then obviously i had skins and i was like well i'm not just going to throw it away i've got to learn how to make my own leather so as soon as i started learning how to make my own leather and working with it that's when i realized like ah leathers leathers actually my most passionate thing i just think it's such an amazing material there's so much you can do with it uh yeah I, so I, sheepskin, I, sheepskin sleeping bags uh that sounds amazing so you're actually the inside is actually sheep fleece yeah i'm getting like wow. a really thin kind of imagine like one mil thick upholstery leather that's really really waterproof so i'm hand stitching a kind of sheepskin sort of you know like a uh, sleeping bag shape out of the leather and then the sheepskins are glued into the inside of that it really is amazing I think you, and yeah. that sounds warm i that sounds like an amazing marketing idea i mean i'd buy one of those immediately uh, that sheepskin is so comfy yeah it's, it's probably the best thing i've ever made i made a lot of bags and some boots and some other knives and stuff i'm pretty proud of but when i made one of these sheepskin sleeping bags i made one for my uh for my daughter first because i wanted her to come camping and i thought i want her to be super warm and cozy so i made her this sheepskin sleeping bag and then as soon as i made one for her i was like oh my god that's amazing i've got to make myself one now yeah it's really exciting so um yeah i'm really excited about starting this other channel because it's going to be kind of mixing a lot of the skills I've learned through the primitive stuff and then actually mixing it in with a lot of modern stuff and showing people how they can actually make all their own kit that's going to last a long time. But yeah, show people how they can make it all themselves. Wow. Um, well, let us know what that channel link and everything is and we'll make sure to share it with our community. We've got a great community on Telegram. If uh, you guys out there are listening or watching and want to join in on the daily conversation it's uh telegram t.me forward slash alpha vedic and we'll also uh add that link to the channel uh for that new channel on the show notes and all that for you john um question have you now have you like fully gone for it before where you've just gone out with just nothing and survived in the wilderness for days on end? and if you have like what's the longest you've gone uh, yeah, I did a really, really long time, like a few, you know, three and a half months with no connection to the modern world where I was eating mice, shrew, rats, pigeons, worms, little birds, like anything. Yeah, I've, I've done it in, it's, it was in a warmer climate. I've not done long-term survival in a really, really cold climate, but yeah, I have spent, yeah, many, many days, hours, months just yeah just fully fully immersed in it that's amazing and, uh, and yeah. what to you was the biggest challenge doing that um i think biggest challenge really is your own mind you know your own mind is the one thing that can be the, the air yeah, can definitely be the most challenging obviously sometimes you can get a bit lonely um i mean i i love it i'm i'm really good with my own company 
Uh, I like, I just love being in nature and obviously, uh, you know, you can't eat chocolate. You don't have all these foods and stuff that taste great. So that's something that takes a bit of adjusting is, uh, you know, having a diet, which, you did know, you, is not, not did you find to. that you were in constant search of protein? Yeah. I mean, I'm a real meat eater anyway, so I'm always searching for, for animals, but when you're in a warmer climate and when your body's in sort of natural ketosis and you've not eaten sugar and you're not eating the carbs, your body's naturally not so hungry anyway. Once you've been on that diet for a while, your body settles into what you would normally eat, your stomach shrinks right down. So that's not really an issue. I'd say for most people, it's going to be your mind, which is probably going to be the most challenging thing. But I just, I just, it's different for everybody. I, I personally, I, I loved it. I, I love living that way. I'd happily live that way forever. <laughs> I'm really, really into it. Did you uh, do a lot of meditation and martial arts while doing that too? How'd you fill your time um, when you weren't foraging or building structures and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Martial arts, meditation, you know, you're always doing something, whether it's making cordage or, with, you know, whittling something, because I was using a lot of stone tools. So things take way, way longer to make when you've got stone tools, especially if they're not very good stone tools. So, yeah, I, I was never bored. You know, there's always something to do. There's always something to get prepared for. You're always keeping an eye on the weather or tracking animals or, you know, the natural world's so fascinating. If you, as soon as you become aware that there's, just stuff going on around you all the time when you slow down as well that's something else that if people have got um, access to nature I recommend just go walk out into nature find a nice spot and just sit down and just don't make a sound and don't move for a whole hour and you will not believe what's really actually going on around you that mm -hmm. you know most of the stuff just hides from us because we move so quickly all the time yeah, I'm a adamant. Um, I'm a kind of a nut when it comes to fishing. I live on a we live on the Smith River here, and actually we've been getting a lot of rain uh, this last few weeks. So the river's up, the steelhead are coming in, the salmon have been in, and um, that's my favorite thing about that. Besides the the skills needed in the hunt for the finding these fish, these majestic creatures here, but is just being in the in the nature by myself or with my dog, and and um, kind of getting that meditative phase of you know, drifting down the river and, and, and witnessing everything around you or all of a sudden an owl will come out of nowhere or a fish will jump and you get caught into the majestic kind of um, rhythms of, of the world uh, that we can lose track of very easily. And um, having hobbies like that, whether it be hiking or whitewater rafting or, um, you know, getting out in nature and, and doing things, um, just going out, like you said, meditating and stuff. Um, talk about uh, if you have any anxieties or uh, any um, depression or any kind of issues, um, nature will be uh, probably one of the best things you can do to alleviate those. Yeah, I find for people, you know, especially people suffering with um, mental health, having a purpose, having a focus, I just think so, so important. I've noticed in my life that you know, if I've not got a goal or a purpose, sometimes you can feel lost. We've got, um, I don't know if you follow boxing, uh, there's Deontay Wilder recently fought a guy called Tyson Fury. He's, uh, he's from England and he has suffered a lot of um, mental health issues. Once he'd won the world championship, he completed the goal he'd been working for his whole life. So it left a sort of void in his life. He'd lost his purpose and and he, you know, he went down, he went serious mental health issues from it. He's got family, he was, he just wanted to die. It's quite a sad story. And but he pulled himself through it and he's come through a bit out the other side now. And he's just saying to people, you know, if there's people out there that are suffering, you know, you just find something, find a purpose. And that's, I think that's kind of the, the big sad story with humanity these days is a lot of people don't have a purpose anymore. I think it's really important for people to have a, a focus and a real purpose in life yeah yeah no that's uh that's a huge part of uh the modern condition is people are just kind of funneled from uh literally the 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 second they're born they're, they're um kind of funneled into the system and uh, they aren't are completely out of touch of who they really are or what their point of being here and 
once again, we're seeing a great awakening right now, though. People are really getting back in touch with all this stuff. And there's massive um, trends right now of uh, travel, you know, people traveling and going to like the national parks here in the United States are, are seeing some of the biggest numbers ever. Um, the whole um, van movement where people are just, you know, picking up and, and, and selling their uh, house or their apartment and moving into a van and just traveling in that. Uh, the tiny home movement. Uh, permaculture, the, the the Earthship movement. There's just all these like really cool things happening right now where people are are really being forced to get back in touch with themselves in these ways, and it's really fun. So, but yeah, you're right on, man. Um, yeah, but I will say overall, I'm seeing the trends going in a very positive way. Yeah, you're right. It's all this stuff is getting really really popular now. I don't know if you guys have. Um, there's a channel on YouTube called Primitive technology is a guy from australia that guy yeah he's the guy who got it he got it all started i know he was the guy i think who actually started making the videos where there's no talking and no music it's just the sounds of him doing whatever he's doing love that guy but you look at how many subscribers he's got he's got almost 10 million subscribers so it just shows that you know this is something that people are really really interested in and i really hope that this movement grows big time i really hope it's something that really really takes off have you seen that other channel i'm blanking on the name of it i think it's somewhere in thailand or uh somewhere in the tropics or in the um somewhere in asia and it's just these two guys who are kind of sped up and they build these massive structures it's all primitive it's just their hands and sticks and they'll build like full-on 10-story tower with a pool and um, I'll have to find the link there, but my kids just love watching that. It's really entertaining. Same thing, no music or anything. You just hear the birds chirping in the background and kind of sped up and they'll build these very impressive structures with just their hands and like a stick and they'll build pools and they'll build, <laughs> they'll build, um, full on like resort looking structures. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. I've seen those. There's a few, there's a few channels kind of popping up like that. Yeah. I find it's it's uh, it's entertaining and good on them. Like there's some some great skills. A lot of the stuff they build is you know it's not necessarily practical, but but good on them. Uh, some of, one of the things I'm really trying to do with my channel specifically is to is to actually show the skills that are actually really really useful and the shelters and stuff that I want to show people are ones that are built you know, because they're, they're going to last and they're really practical and they're safe. Something I do know from watching a lot of the structures built on YouTube is I can't imagine that they last very long. You know, I think a lot of these structures are built and probably within a couple of months they're falling down. So one of the things I want to show is how you can build these primitive natural structures, but build them in a way that they're safe and they're going to last. Yeah, that's a great point. I just dropped your channel. Um in the uh, chat here. Well, uh, let me help you out too, John. You've got to get you uh, your channel name and your, uh, your link there. Uh, you have enough subscribers now to do that. But um, yeah, uh, I just dropped it in there. We'll put it in the sh show notes. It's called Primitive Ways. And let's get the uh, subscriber count up here, guys. This, this, this content's too good to have this low of views. Kind of like how we are right now. We're new, you're new. So we're helping each other out. Um, but this really great content. So uh, Primitive Ways is the YouTube channel. Just drop it in the chat. We'll make sure to we get it uh, in the show notes too. And please go uh, follow John on his journey as he educates uh, people on how to get out there and use these skills. Uh, have fun with it. Um, any parting words for our community, John? Uh, yeah, get out there. Get out there and start trying it. You know, it's you won't believe how these skills, how they'll change your life, how they stimulate your curiosity, how they, they give you as well. They, they really give you um, kind of your intelligence back and understanding how things work. And you can, all these things that I've learned as well, they, so much of it you can transfer to the modern world. Like whenever, you know, like for instance, today I was just helping my friend do a bit of painting and a bit of plaster work and patching off his roof. And, it just all seems so easy because of all these skills that I've done. But I, yeah, just, just, I just think people would just, just get out there and just go for it. But yeah, people should definitely start trying to learn how to make primitive fire because that's the one that, um, yeah, that's a journey. That's a really, really cool journey to be on. And, uh, and also Tom, so Tom Brown's got, 
a lot of um, sort of story books and stuff like that, but it does have these field guides. There's one called Living with the Earth, and then there's Wilderness Survival, and then there's Urban and City Survival as well, but he's got some field guides. So if anybody's interested in these skills, obviously YouTube's great, but if you want a book which has got all these skills in it, then just get Tom Brown Jr.'s Wilderness Survival. It's an amazing book. Very cool. Yeah, and also you just, I mean, having these skills, you walk around wherever you are with a lot of confidence. It's like kind of like doing martial arts. Well, you do that as well, but it just it just gives you an air of, you know, confidence and um, that you are equipped to be able to handle yourself in any situation. And that's a powerful thing for anybody to have. Um, yeah. Also, speaking of field guides, I ha- I've had this one for 10 years. Um, John Lofty Wiseman, uh, a survival handbook, SAS. It's, I don't know if you're familiar with this one. This one's great. It's got everything from doing all your different traps and it's got uh, great color photos here for, uh, foraging with, um, you know, wild foraging. It's basically a, an all-in-one book um, for survivaling out in, in um, both, um, you know, any climate, land, or sea. So John Lofty Wiseman, I think he's kind of a legend in the scene too. But um, anyhow, yeah, it's, it makes sense. Like, get a book, get, get these kind of guides, because you really will need them. You won't be able to get on the internet. So use the internet now and use YouTube. But you know, powers out and you really need to start using these skills, you won't be able to access it online. So develop libraries, get books, because um, those are important to have too, as far as those, hey, that's a type of primitive technology, right? So, um, well, hey, any parting words uh, uh, for the community bear over there? No, I just, uh, John, great message today. Uh, really enjoyable chat. Um, thank you so much for everything you're doing. And uh, good for you to just get out there and do it because that's what it takes. And um, thank you. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be in touch. And uh, I'd love to see you over on your side of the pond someday there. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and I've got... Um, I've got a lot more really, really, really good videos to come. I'm really, um, I'm actually really, really into doing the YouTube videos and I'm going to make a lot more stuff and I'm really, you know, keen to spread it and share it with people. So yeah, just keep an eye on my channel because there's a lot more stuff coming. Wonderful. Absolutely. Once again, guys, John Hickman's been our guest today. His channel you can find on YouTube is Primitive Ways and he's got a new one coming too, which will be really exciting to follow. Um, so please uh, go and subscribe to his channel, uh, go on to his videos, like them, uh, drop comments, whatever we can to help support him because he's doing really amazing work. And if you like this show today and aren't following us yet, you can go to alphavedic.com and you can join the mailing list to get updates on future shows. We've got some amazing guests coming in January. We're going to take, uh, we're going to take some time off coming into the holidays. We've got, uh, the whole alphavedic crew together here for Christmas into the new year. So we're going to be enjoying some, um, some time together and uh, I may do a live stream next week just for fun, not a pot official alpha cast, but just to kind of say hi to the community. We're going to start doing some more of those. And then um, Bear and Deb, I have um, some exciting uh, new ventures on their end um, that uh, as far as video content they'll be doing, which will be more based on the off grid farm there and connecting with the land. A lot of things uh, John was talking about today in terms of permaculture, biodynamic farming, and living off grid. So we're really excited about 2020. We've got some uh, amazing content coming your way uh, in terms of both uh, the AlphaCast uh, podcast, live streaming, and uh, additional media. Uh, Like I said earlier, you can join us on Telegram. Uh, That is our online community that's really growing and um, is just full of amazing human beings human beings and they're talking about uh, everything ranging from consciousness development, spirituality to uh, health and alternative thinking. And it's just an amazing community. So you can join that at t.me forward slash alpha Vedic. And then, like I said, go to alpha Vedic.com for all of our other social links. We're on discord, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. cetera. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. And uh, have a wonderful uh, holidays if you're celebrating Christmas. Um, you know, spend some time with family, be thankful and grateful. 
uh, that uh, we're all here in this uh, wild adventure together. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers.